All right, Joel Gostin here from joelgostin.com. Uh, for this conversation, I'm delighted to be joined by somebody who uh, I was thinking earlier about this, David. I think the last time you and I had a proper chat, uh, one that wasn't typed out, was about 17 years ago, perhaps. Yeah, it must be that. Yeah, definitely. It, it, it's been more than a minute, so we're overdue for this. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Likewise. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome from England, Mr. David Humphrey. David, great to see you. And you, Joel. Thank you. I appreciate you coming on board for uh, this conversation, um, which I've wanted to do for a long time because um, of all the musicians I know, uh, no one quite has the narrative that you have. Um, you've had a pretty eclectic history involved with some very interesting artists. So we certainly have a lot we can get into in this conversation. Uh, That's great. But to certainly bring it back to the very beginning, um, I, I often ask my guests, um, how did music first become such a major part of their lives? And in your case, particularly, how did drumming become such a big part of what you do? Well, that's a long, uh, a long history about that, Joel. I, I mean, I was probably, my recollection, I was about five when I first started getting fascinated with drums. And I always remember standing in front of uh, some drummers, just standing there staring, looking at the, the drummers playing a hi-hat. That was one thing that really fascinated me about drums and, and the kit itself. But I didn't really start seriously till I was about 14. And I sort of badgered my dad to say, look, I, I want to take up drums. I'm really interested in doing that. And he said, well, I'll do that, providing you you go and have proper lessons and if the tutor thinks you're good enough then we'll do it so I found a private tutor and um, the rest was history really you know I had, had a, a few lessons and it was only a, a few months I suppose and I was in my first band so I sort of really took off and uh, you know knuckled down and <laughs> and the rest is history really. Excellent so this would have been um, mid-70s yeah when things started to yeah and, well just before i think it was about 73 74 when when i started um and then i started playing in local bands from that so it was really doing local pubs and clubs and in some cases because i looked so young i was oh, what 14 15 i had to be smuggled in to actually play so that was quite that was quite interesting but uh but yeah, it was a really good grounding, you know, and it's, it's nothing like actually learning from grassroots upwards and get getting the feel, working with other musicians and um, doing the legwork, really. And, and that's where it all started. So stylistically, um, what kind of music were you playing in those early days? Oh, it was really covers, I think, mainly. It was sort of, sort of Al Green and a lot of the uh, sort of covers there. Um, hey Joe. You know the usual standards that uh, you know that you, you used to get there free, and um, all all of those kinds of bands really. And it wasn't until um, I think it was I'm just trying to think about seventy six seventy seven. I felt that I really needed to to do something to progress because playing standards was was great and it was a a, a nice learning curve. But I wanted to progress technically. And I, I'd done a search and I think it was a Melody Maker ad that I, I answered and ended up with my really, what I would call my first real band, which was Seventh Seal, which, which was a jazz rock outfit. Mm. Um, so I went and auditioned for them. And again, I picked up things so quickly with them. It was, it was a lot of technical um, sort of playing that I, I hadn't come across. It was totally new music because they were really into uh like the Mahavishnu Orchestra, John McLaughlin. Uh, so it was really quite intense and everything was, you know, their own material. So it, it was new for me having to put and put my own input to it. So that was really, you know, really good. And I really, really enjoyed it. And how long was your run with Seventh Seal? Oh, that must have been about three years. But what a three years that there was some... Uh, there was some fantastic times, uh, you know, doing that. And and obviously the amount of contacts that I'd made from that, which was uh, which was brilliant. I mean, really, to start with, um, 
one of the the guys uh, in the band um he he had a friend called paul calver who ended up being our manager and um he he actually worked at loughton uh, he was actually i think one on the social committee at loughton college and uh, one of the tutors there uh english tutor i believe in sociology turned out to be mark Knopfler from dire straits um, so that was one connection that we had through Paul and we ended up getting an audition uh, with Muff Winwood, uh, which was, I believe, at uh, CBS at the time. I think he was doing some A&R work there. But unfortunately, because we had such a big uh, pyrotechnic show and that the amount of money it would have taken to to sort of take that forward with a record deal, it just didn't work. Uh, but, you know, it, it was great. It was really good. And it was about the time that Mark Knopfler had been signed uh, mm. with Dire Straits. So funny enough, he'd heard our band. He wanted um, myself and the bass player to go to the marquee. I didn't know who it was at first. And so went back, you know, was, was having a chat. So it was really, it was really, yeah, uh, you know, when I look back on that now, it was, um, you know, something that you're not going to be forgetting too, too soon to be <laughs> Well, it, it's a bit of an interesting time uh, to be doing the music Seventh Seal was performing because this is 76, 77. Yeah. So, you know, sort of concurrently with bands like yourself and, and you know, more of the prog winning bands. Yes. Yeah. They were still working, but you also had this growing punk movement at the same time, which yeah. in some ways was a bit of the antithesis of that more yeah. traditional sort of, you know, let's, sh so let's show off our musicality kind of stuff that was going on in those days. Yeah. Um, and you kind of bridged yeah. the gap yourself because um, from what I understand, it was through Seventh Seal in an odd way um, that you got the gig in Public Image Limited. Yeah, I mean, that that was, you know, that was... Uh quite by chance. I mean, we, as I mentioned, Paul Calver was our manager and he actually owned Rollerball Studios, which is in Tooby Street in, in London. And at the time, and Peel were rehearsing there, along with um, another band, which was a sort of a, a mod band called uh, Secret Affair. And I believe Spandau Ballet were even rehearsing there. But it turned out that um, a couple of the guys, Tony Dow and Joe DeVere, uh, from the band, we're actually doing work with Peel, i.e. roadie in, and also doing some sound engineering with them. And it was through Tony that I actually had the introduction after Jim Walker had left. Mm. And I auditioned and the rest was history. It was straight off to the manor to uh, to do what is now known as Metal Box. So it was, uh, you know, it was a whirlwind, really. You know, it sort of went from one thing straight to, to the other. And you were all of 19 at the time? Yeah, yeah, 19. Yeah, so literally from starting playing at sort of 15, within the four years, I was <laughs> ending up at, at, at the Manor Recording Metal Box. And obviously from that, um, you know, I, I ended up getting offers from um, Virgin to do some work with Mike Oldfield and then Spark saw me on top of the pops and asked me to to do some stuff with them on their um, UK tour, which was which was brilliant. So got to do some top of the pops, and uh, it was a, a children's show called Crackerjack over here. So that was quite fun as well. <laughs> so it's quite a trajectory um, yeah. within a, a relatively short period of time. Yeah. Um, going back to your entry into Pill. Um, so you were the first drummer after Jim Walker. Yeah. Um, and I know when Jim left the band, it sort of kickstarted this sort of endless stream of drummers there for a bit. Um, yeah. And Metal Box reflects that. There are multiple drummers. There's herself, obviously. Yeah. Uh, uh, Richard Dudansky's on the album. Uh, Martin Atkins, of course. Yeah. Um, Wobble and Keith play drums, I believe, on a couple of tracks as well. Right. Um, and it, it's a funny thing with pill. I know, you know, we've talked about it before, in the past, but I know speaking for myself as somebody who, you know, because I'm a journalist, I try to put the pieces together. Um, and I, I did a, I did a big feature on wobble a few years back and I was trying to, 
put certain things together. And pill is such a mess to <laughs> try to figure out and piece together. Um, it's probably the most challenging subjects I've ever had um, as a journo because it's all over the place. And yeah. the, the stories tend to change depending on who from the band yeah. you're speaking to at that time. Um, but since I'm speaking to you, um, yeah. I wanted to first ask you, you know, obviously you're joining a band at 19, fronted by somebody who has a lot of notoriety already, um, a controversial figure. Um, what was your initial impressions of Leiden when you started working with him? Yeah, I'm, I mean, obviously you hear the hype, um, you know, from the from the Sex Pistols. And I always remember the first TV sort of show when they, they were on, I think it was the Today Show. And, um, yeah, it was quite, you know, well, swear words and everything else going on there. So, it, you know, it made a, a bit of a, a controversy over here. But meeting him for the first time, it was the total opposite to what I'd imagined. He was very sort of subdued, very laid back, but very astute. Um, so you, you could see the cogs turning behind his eyes, if you know what I mean, when, when, uh, when you, you spoke to him. Uh, but during the time in the band, I never really had that much engagement. He was very aloof at that time. Um, so really a lot of the contact and the engagement that I had was with Wobble and obviously the bass drum sort of partnership in that. But in terms of the personality wise, that, that, that was the, the guy that I sort of latched onto. Um, so, I mean, even to this day, we still have contact now and again, but I've never had any contact with, with Leiden since the time I was with Pill. Mm. Well, um, I just recently did a video uh, with Pete Jones, uh, a later mm. member of Pill. Um, and he described uh, Keith and John as, um, if I'm remembering correctly, sort of uh, musically illiterate. And he didn't say that as a criticism. Uh, yeah. He said that to illustrate the fact that maybe because they didn't know what they were doing, they could do anything. Yeah. Uh, and he certainly remarked on the sense of experimentation and freedom of yeah. being you know, a classical musician, let's say. Um, so you're coming from this, you know, very intense musical history playing with Seven Seal. Now you're in Pill and you're playing with Wobble on bass. Um, how yeah. would you say that sort of affected what you brought to the proceedings as a drummer coming from this more experienced background? And here you are playing with this very, um, maybe... Uh, in terms of education, very rudimentary group of musicians, but also very innovative at the same time? Firstly, um, I found the concept of coming from Seventh Seal and working with Pill were totally alien. It was it was a totally different way of working. And I, I you know, I, I wasn't used to that. I was re rehearsing four or five nights a week um, to nothing, basically, and just the odd jams here and there. So that was really you know strange from my from my perspective but on the other hand i felt there was a freedom as well because it allowed me then to just sort of jam and just let things flow naturally rather than having things sort of mapped out so that that was quite good and as you probably know a lot of um the recordings that were done for Met metal box were actually improvised so, you know, even the, the point that I didn't even realise it was being recorded. So I was actually quite free in what I was doing. So that that was interesting. Um, but, yeah, it was a, a totally different different way of working. And even to this day, I look back and think it was the manic times. <laughs> it was really weird. <laughs> well, um, as I said, uh, the history of Pill is a disaster from a, mm. a factual perspective. Um, but let's get into what I believe is the case in terms of your contributions to Metal Box. Um, you play drums on Albatross. Yeah. That's that's fact. You play drums on Swan Lake, a.k.a. Death Disco. Yeah. That's fact. Um, are those definitively the, the two tracks you're on on Metal Box that made it onto the record? 
Yeah, I mean, it was it was a really weird um, weird scenario when we first got to the manor because I was asked to record what was the original first edition songs that were on there, including Public Image itself. And I was quite, you know, obviously new to the band and they wanted me to to just do that. So as you do, you just follow and, and just do it. But I, I recall during the time we were there, Richard Branson actually came down to the manor and halted proceedings because what was going on there shouldn't have happened apparently. Um, and that's when we started to work on what is now, um, you know, the, the Metal Box album. But I, to this day, I don't know why I was asked to record the original tracks. Um, so I was literally playing back to, you know, the, the original uh, tapes that had been done. So um, and, and at one point, I ended up having the drum kit set up in what was the billiard hall in the manor itself, because John didn't like the sound that was in the studio. Um, so there was a more live sound there. So I ended up having to do most of it on my own in the middle of the night, <laughs> just recording what they'd asked me to do. It was it was manic. And uh, here here's one example of where things are sticky mm. uh, in terms of information. The uh, the Death Disco 12 inch um, has a couple of B sides. One being a remix of Death Disco, and the second being. Um, I guess we can describe it as a remix or a re-recording of Fodder Stumpf. Um, yeah. There are sources that credit you as the drummer. There are some that credit Dudansky on that track. That yeah. was you, though, on that track, correct? I believe so. And from what I understand from um, reliable sources, that that wasn't recorded subsequently. That That was me on, on that. Um, so I don't ever remember because Death Disco, from what I recall, and even talking to to Tony, who was with Pill, uh, this is Tony Dow, who was with Pill most of the time anyway. He said that I was the first one to actually record it, even though it may well have been banded about, you know, between them beforehand. I was the the, the only one that actually recorded it at that time. So whoever, if they did re-record it, they would have followed what I had done previously. Mm -hmm. so I, th I think that was the case and I've 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 actually seen um, I think it was a top of the pops of death disco as well and I know for a fact because I I was I was the person that actually chose the drum kit and went to the shop to pick that out and so any drummer that's been playing obviously must have been after me because that was the kit that was used on on the uh, the actual tv show so there are things even now that I have to scratch my head and think was that me wasn't that but you, you know your own signature you know what you how you sound and what you what you do so um yeah so i would probably stick my neck out and say that that wasn't recorded afterwards that would have been me unless they've actually uh, managed to recreate what i did yeah yeah i i agree you certainly have a distinct sound that's what's interesting about metal box being a drummer mm. myself is everyone who has played on that album or had put on an album has their own sound yeah um, you can definitely hear atkins um i played with martin I yeah know my signature sound anywhere i know your sound for better or for worse i know keith's sound behind a drum kit which is he's a great guitarist right yeah um you know and and richard as well i mean you all have a distinct sound so it kind of makes for an interesting compilation of drummers on one record um but drummers kind of came and went at that point i think they had carl burns from the fall as well but someone in the band set him on fire at least yeah. I, imagined. I heard that so Mind you, I, I had my sorry joel I, I had my stint as well at the manor i i was uh finished one session I remember i was so tired I, I found my way up to the the bedroom only to find a big lump of coal stuck in the bed so I wasn't too happy because I just wanted to get to sleep, you know. So I ended up not worrying about that. And I ended up sleeping in the studio. I thought, I can't be asked for this. So I ended up going back on the Chesterfield suites in the studio. I thought, I'm just going to get my head down. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. 
And, you know, hindsight is always 2020. Um, and Metal Box, uh, uh, justifiably so, in my opinion, has grown in in reverence over the years. It's now considered very much an iconic album. Uh, personally speaking, I think it's the best thing Pill ever did, best thing John ever did. Um, and a lot of people would agree with that statement. At the time, um, was there any sense that what was being put down on tape um, would have any sort of effect of this nature many years later? That Did you guys know that you were doing something so different that it would be looked up looked upon as a you know a, a classic of its time today yeah, personally i i you know i was so naive at that time i i didn't even look that far ahead um i was really sort of thinking and pinching pinching myself really in, in the fact that i was actually here recording and doing what i've always wanted to do um but no from from a personal perspective there there wasn't any sort of feeling that this was going to become anything iconic in in that sense and i know obviously you know history um <laughs> tells you that there was a lot of bands that were influenced by the album itself um but uh, you know once i'd left peel i'd actually lost contact with the whole the whole side of that so i never really followed it to be honest with you it was only years later that i decided to to sort of follow up with it. And I contacted, um, I think it was the um, the unofficial website for the Stomp and done an interview with them. And, um, you know, it was only through that that they even knew that I'd actually been on the album. They didn't even know who I was. Mm. So it was, um, I thought to myself, well, there's, you know, there's no credits on the, the actual album itself for anybody. So it, I thought, well, you know, it's only right that you, you have to, um, you know, make make a, a sort of stand in terms of saying, well, I did actually perform on this, and and that's where it started, really. Mm. What were your thoughts on the finished album when it was all said and done? I, I suppose powerful. I mean, it was totally diverse to what I'd been used to, um, but there was... There was, I mean, the, the main thing that stood out for me in terms of the, obviously, obviously you know, I enjoyed playing the, the tracks that I did, but I think Wobble, I think he's the, the guy that came across, obviously the relationship that I had with Wobble was a drum and bass, but that that side of it was was so heavy. And I, and I know that if you had that on full on speakers, you're not going to have your speakers for long. <laughs> for, for some reason... That managed to get so much bass into that, I couldn't believe it. I think in some cases it actually jumped on the vinyl. It was, you know, it was that heavy. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I, I've got luckily I've got an album downstairs, and that stays nicely in its case in the in the cupboard because they're so difficult to get out as well. That's the other thing, the canisters. I don't know if you've tried to get them out, but I, I don't want to risk ruining it, to be honest. So I've just left them, left them in there. Yeah, I, I've seen a few at uh, record collector events, and you know I'm tempted to buy it, but at the same time I'm like, you know, it's probably the vinyls probably beat to hell because people have, over the years probably tried to open it and yeah, you know. Um, so I, I I got the CD version instead, and that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but by the time the album was completed, mm. um, your time in Pill was was over. Yeah. Um, what led to you know the parting of the ways uh, in the studio during that time? Again, that was that was surreal. Um, and again, it's like the rest of the the album itself. It's very sketchy, and depending on who you speak to. Um, at the time, I remember I was at the townhouse and Wobble came through during one of the sessions. He said, oh, John's just mentioned, he said that um, he's, he's not not been really happy with you actually doing a top of the pops with Sparks and Mike Oldfield. Um, and so therefore, you know, he didn't want you to come back. It was, a, it was a, literally as blunt as that. But I, I thought that was a bit off actually getting wobbled to to do that and John never spoke to me he never said anything at all mm -hmm. um 
but in hindsight that I've sort of discovered more recently is that what I understand that John had had various different ideas about the way and direction that he wanted the album to go. Originally he wanted a sort of more disco funk type feel. That's why I was brought in and then changed. And I think that's the reason why personally now looking in hindsight, what, what probably happened. Um, but I was, you know, always under the impression and the reason I was given is because I hadn't really got, got permission to do work with Mike Oldfield and Sparks. Mm. But at the end of the day, the way that I saw it then is that there was nothing going on with, with Peel rehearsing wise and everything else. And I was at a, a, a free end, so to speak. So I said, yeah, great. I'll do it. You know, I was approached by Virgin to, to do that. Would you like to do a top of the pops with Mike Oldfield? And I wasn't going to say no. You know, it was, it was great. And from there led on to the Sparks work as well. So, uh, yeah. And, and Mike Oldfield, um, to remind the viewers, uh, Mike Oldfield in the States is perhaps best known for Tubular Bells, yeah. some of which is used as the theme for The Exorcist. That's it. Um, you know, so Mike was Mike was a bit of a big deal back then, especially. Uh, um, so you did the Top of the Pops with him. Um, did Sparks follow that or was it? Yeah. I mean, basically, I was asked by, um, I think it was Tessa from the, um, I think it was from the, the Press and Publications Department, whether I wanted to do uh, a session with Mike Oldfield. So I said, yeah, great. So I actually went down. We'd done a pre-recorded session uh, at Olympic Studios, uh, which was, again, an I iconic studio in London. Uh, which is now, I believe, a cinema. Uh, but at the time, I did the um, the sort of pre-recording. And during that time with Top of the Pops, they used to, um, because of the Musicians' Union, you had to do a pre-recorded session so that you would actually not do the musician out of a fee for doing that. But when it got to the, the TV, then they would actually use the original tape to do it. But on this occasion, they actually, actually used the, the actual recording that we did. So the, the version that's actually played on top of the pops of Guilty is the recorded session that we did. Mm. So that, that, that in itself is quite, um, you know, rare. So um, th that's on YouTube as well. So, you know, that, that can be looked at. But, uh, but yeah, that, that was a, a great session. I, I always recall that. But what I didn't know is that Sparks were on, I think, playing number one song in heaven, but they had a different drummer at the time. And uh, I believe Keith Fossey couldn't make the others. And they asked whether I would be able to do the, the rest of the, um, the sort of promotions. And uh, I sort of gladly obliged with that. And so done the, the TV sessions with them. But they're really nice guys and, you know, really, really good to work with. Yeah, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to hear that because they um, they strike me as um, interesting people to be around. You know, they have a very yeah. unique image, uh, yeah. very unique sound. You know, Sparks is one of those groups that I think people either get them, get them, or or completely it goes over people's heads. <laughs> you know, there's no, there's no middle ground there. Yeah. So so you did a lot in a very short period of time. Yeah worked with a few different musicians i mean to, to, to go from keith levine to mike oldfield i mean that's a bit of a leap you know um but i, I wanted to ask you specifically about keith because obviously and sadly we did lose him uh, yeah. a few years back um and from to my ears keith during metal box i mean that was that was levine at his absolute creative peak you know yeah um i i have to ask you what the experience was like working with him because he was such a singular unique character musically from from my fans perspective you know no yeah. one quite sounds like keith no one ever has sounded like keith um and i i've got on record as saying my opinion when he left pill the spirit of pill went with you know yeah um so I know it's been some years since you've worked with him, but um, what still stands out in your mind about the experience of recording with Keith? Yeah. I mean, the f very first 
very, if I can go back to it, the very first time when I met Keith, obviously was at the audition. And there was a funny little story about this one because I obviously gone through and played, played obviously some different styles of, of what, what we were doing there. Went, I can't remember actually what we actually played. Um, but uh, I did a couple of different tracks and, and uh, just played that. And then there was a, a, a brief interval. And I got up and I said to Keith, oh, can I sort of have a, just a quick go of your guitar? So he said, oh, yeah, fine. So I strummed it and I thought, everything's out of key. He, he had a unique way of tuning that guitar to get that unique sound. Um, and then obviously after that, as we done Metal Box, I, I, could, I could see that there was something there that, I couldn't just put my finger on. Is a, a sort of genius, I suppose, in how he played. Um, part of it was me thinking jazz rock, that doesn't sound right. And there's the other part saying, like you mentioned, Joel, about being very creative. There's no boundaries in terms of because he didn't have that sort of training in that respect. Um, so, yeah, it was it was. I don't know, it's a sort of love hate thing, I suppose. In terms of personality wise, we didn't didn't really gel, should I say. We didn't gel. I think there were boundaries there, which when that being the new boy there, I think that he tried to um assert his influence, I suppose, in certain ways. And I just re rebuffed that and said, Well, no, I'm not doing that. You know, I, w I wouldn't sort of bow to that that kind of pressure to do things just because I've been told to do it. Um and I think that had more respect with him. So then that was great. And then afterwards it was fine. I think it was good. But uh, but yeah, I suppose musically, um, it took me a little bit of time to adjust to his thinking how he played, uh, to how I'd been used to playing with the jazz rock sort of outfit. So so yeah, but uh, you you can't take the genius away. There's, there's something there. And as I say, it's so sad that... Um, you know, he, he passed. I was quite shocked when uh, I'd heard the news. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it was certainly nice, though, to see um, the accolades come out uh, yeah. after his passing, you know, from from very, you know, sort of above ground mainstream <sighs> media sources, you know, giving respect to Keith and the fact that he had this interesting and very influential sound. Um, you know, you can you can hear Keith Levine a hundred miles away and know it's him. <laughs> yeah, no comparison there. Definitely. Um, so you know the, the pill thing happens; it, it runs its course for you. Sparks, Mike Goldfield. Am I correct that Reflex was the next band that you were part of that sort of put you know had had done a record and, and had a, a bit of a time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically after that, there was a, a sort of a brief period where I wasn't really doing that much. And then I decided with with um, one of the guys that, um, or a friend of ours, that actually done some recording uh, with Seventh Seal, um, we actually formed um, Star Records just so that we could have a go at doing some trial runs at putting a, a sort of vinyl out. And I did, I did one sort of demo uh, and put that out under the name of Highway Motion, which has subsequently been reissued um, on Freestyle Records recently. Um, and Reflex then followed that, and I formed the band, uh, bringing in members and ex-members that I'd used to work with in some of the earlier days when I started. And in fact, one of the bass player was in the very first band that I, I sort of auditioned for. Um, so... We recorded at Vineyard Studios in London um, with a guy who engineered it called Simon Sullivan. And at that time, he just finished recording um, with John Rocker's band um, doing uh, Freeze and Southern Freeze, which was a, a big, a big sort of um, Brit funk hit over here. Uh, I don't know whether that actually made the States out there at the time, uh, but it was it was quite a, a big track over here. And. We recorded that, but unfortunately, because we didn't have, you know, that, that kind of record backing, uh, it really sort of laid low for around 40 years and then was picked up by, I was approached by Matthew Carter from Paint the Picture Records, who said, 
love the track that would really like to reissue that. And so that was reissued on vinyl in 2021, uh, I believe it was. And that really did well. That really did well. And and I, I, I didn't know until then that the original of that had been selling in the region of the six, seven hundred pounds just for the seven inch vinyl. So uh, because of its rarity um, and that that had been played in a lot of places in France. Apparently it was quite big on the scene out there. And, and I had no clue about this. It was it was really strange. And so I said to Matt, yeah, I'd love to do a, a sort of reissue. And it's still out there now and still doing well. That's fantastic. Um, am I correct that uh, most of the 80s and, and subsequent years were fairly quiet for you on the musical front? Yeah, yeah. I, I, to be honest, I got quite disillusioned following the, the, um, the time in Pill. Um, You're not the only I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was really strange because I think a lot of musicians like yourself, you go through a, a period where you sort of take stock and think, is it really worth doing this? You know, if you're not doing it because you enjoy doing it, is it worth carrying on? And I, I sort of, you know, with family commitments and other things going on, you, you think, no, maybe I should just give it a bit of a, a time. And, it, and that turned out to be a few years until um, around two, I think it was around 2003, I decided to get into teaching. And I did that for 10 years. So um, that started to sort of get the enthusiasm going again, building up a, a base, working with various ages and people. And, and obviously, you know, I love working with, with the kids on that in schools and, do, you know, churches, all, all different manner of, uh, um, you know, sort of people interested in drums. Even even it was a lady in her 70s that I was teaching. So it, there's no bound, as you know, there's no boundaries to it. It's got so many different advantages for therapeutic advantages mental health oh. fitness you name it. it it's got it's got lots and lots of benefits so uh, that was very very rewarding and then recently obviously then i started getting more into producing and writing so that's where i'm at at the moment and i definitely wanted to get into that um you have been releasing music for some time now um, under the name Davy H. That's right. Um, and when I post a video, I'll put a link up for people to check that music out. And I really recommend they do. Um, from what I've heard of that material, it's it's dance music. I guess we can call it that. Um, and it's it's fantastic dance music. Um, I'm a fan of that genre myself. Um, you know, being a fan of rhythm, you kind of have to be. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, like the, the one song you have, Keep Moving, that's a beautiful track. That's a lovely Thank you. Track. Thank um, you. With a mystery singer, um, from what I understand. So we'll maybe keep it as such. Or less. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can, I can, I can, I can say that it, her name's Michelle. She's actually based in New York. Um, and Michelle's really a, a session vocalist. But the reason I couldn't feature her. Um, is the fact that um, it's not that I didn't want to. It's the fact that she's obviously doing her own session. So that would obviously, I think, compromise other work that she's doing. So obviously you don't want to be tagged with the same label with another artist. And I, I know lots of artists do similar work, but either don't get credited or go under a different name. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, she was a fabulous find, fabulous voice. Um, and again, obviously, I'd uh, be using Michelle again when I can. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I, I really like that stuff, David. Um, you know, it's certainly, and, and your career has been versatile the entire time. You know, I, I can't say punk drummer David Humphrey or, or yeah. drummer David Humphrey. You're kind of been all over the place, which is what I love from a musician. Um, you know, the eclecticism comes through yeah. in your, your body of work. Um, and this new stuff is fantastic. Um, we're still relatively early into 2024. Um, how do things look for the rest of your year as far as musical projects and things you have in the works artistically? 
Well, I suppose um, literally just now, I've literally released one a couple of days ago now, uh, and it was the, the remix of Keep Moving. Um, that was primarily to coincide with our son's um, challenge that he's been doing for out, the Alzheimer's Society. Um, he's just completed the Three Peaks Challenge uh, in 24 hours, so that's, that's no mean feat, actually, doing that. And he's got a, a further um, challenge, which is the European uh, Three Peaks, coming up, I believe, in May. And then um, he's got another one later in the year, which is uh, for Mont Blanc, etc. So he, he's he's got a lot, and he's, he's quite dedicated in doing that. So, uh, But I thought at least that I can do is put something out that will help promote that. It's a free download anyway, but, you know, it wasn't really for me. This is just to raise the profile so that it would attract his, um, his just giving page and hopefully towards a, a cause that's quite close to our family's heart anyway, in terms of the dimension and how that affects a number of people all over the globe. So, uh, yeah, hopefully we can uh, fight this uh, awful disease that's going about. And, uh, he, you know, he's, he's doing his little bit to, uh, to do that. Wonderful. Well, like I said, um, when I post the video, um, I'll include some information on that as well. Yes. So people can uh, check out your music and and the cause as well and, and get some information how they can contribute. Um, but I, I'll tell you what, David, like I said, you know, it's a funny thing how the world works. I'm sure I would suspect you didn't imagine prior to the Internet that um you'd be contacted fairly regularly from people to, to discuss the pill record you know you did back in the 70s yeah but that's how you and i first connected back in the ancient myspace days. yeah 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 um you know and it's it's wonderful that all these years later we've we've re remained in touch and that you uh agreed to come on and and do an interview for the channel um you, you've had a remarkable history uh with great input and I only wish you the very best and, and greatest happiness creating moving forward. No, thank you, Joe. It's, it's been a, a privilege and it's been great catching up. And uh, hopefully, um, just to say as well, there is the Keith Levine bio biography, I believe it is, coming coming out soon. Um, so hopefully that, that should shed some light on, on Keith's life and obviously help towards his estate, etc. And... Uh, you know, hopefully, uh, I've I've done a little contribution towards that. So I'm just waiting to see, um, you know, when that's uh, actually going to be published. So I understand it's been picked up by a publisher now, but uh, we just need to wait and see, you know, when that's going to happen. Yeah, that's great. I mean, talk about a subject worthy of that kind of a project. Um, yeah, you know, tremendous talent, very much missed. Uh, fortunately, we've got the music we can still listen to um you know to uh learn you know learn about keith because his playing there's always every time i listen to pill particularly metal box i hear something new mm. and i've been listening to that record for a long time yeah um you know but it certainly sounds fresh with every listen um thanks and in, in, in no small part to your contribution to it Thank um, you. yeah absolutely and it's just been an honor to reconnect and uh let's not wait 17 years until we do this again <laughs> i'm not sure i'll be around in 17 years but i hope so <laughs> well we'll we'll shorten the time frame and we'll leave it <laughs> we'll do this again very soon i promise indeed thank you joel much appreciated thank you very much david thank you you take care you as well thank you